by thanking the organizers, uh, Alain Liveau, Menachem Megador, and Boban Blitschkovic. So today I'm going to talk about uh, joint work with Benji Weiss. And the idea behind all of this is to classify the measure-preserving transformations, or not. Always the same suspect since. Uh, <laughs> um, now the question, all, the question of classification, always comes down to classify up to what, and here there are a couple of natural choices. Uh, the first is conjugation by measure-preserving transformations, uh, which I'm going to write as equivalence sub MPT. And this is a very attractive kind of classification because it captures the statistical behavior of your system, in particular of stochastic processes. And the other, if you have a topological space, if you have additional structure than a measure, is to classify conjugacy by homeomorphisms, or even if you don't have a measure, if you just have a, a, diffeom a diffeomorphism, for example. And this preserves the topological dynamics, preserves the, the kinds of topological properties. Now, in order to uh, attack this problem, you want to see where uh, measure-preserving transformations occur in nature. And one of the uh, most common, probably the most common way they occur, is to use the Maharam von Neumann theorem to remark that every standard measure space, which are the only kind I'm going to consider, so separable non-atomic measure space is isomorphic to the unit interval, so every measure-preserving transformation is isomorphic to a measure-preserving transformation on the unit interval, and therefore the measure-preserving transformations of the unit interval are uh, universal space. And this is very nice because that's also a Polish group, and the ergodic transformations are a density delta, and so on and so forth. This is a very nice natural setting, but a little bit abstract because for a measure-preserving transformation that arises in nature, there's often a lot of other structure around that that you might try to use as part of a classification. Another example, which I'll talk about a lot, is to take some alphabet sigma, which is countable or finite. We're going to be worried about finite alphabets. And you take sigma to the z. So you have a natural shift action on sigma to the z, and you have a probability measure mu, which is invariant under the shift. So these are the so-called uh, symbolic systems. And a final one, which final one for today, that we'll be talking about is the space of diffeomorphisms of a compact, smooth manifold. And the measure here is something given by a volume element, a smooth volume element, which is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure. That's just a fancy way of saying that it is Lebesgue measure. I mean, okay. Uh, so the, of the three, the one that you might have the best chance of having a classification for is the space of diffeomorphisms because the C-infinity diffeomorphisms have the most structure. If you have a compact manifold, the collection of diffeomorphisms, it's, 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 you don't have complete freedom in the way that you build diffeomorphisms. In particular, there's, it's much more restrictive than just building an arbitrary measure-preserving transformation of the unit interval. So the question that I'm going to talk about today is can the additional structure that comes from being the group of diffeomorphisms, measure-preserving diffeomorphisms of a compact manifold, can this additional structure be used for a classification? Or if you want to view this <laughs> as a pessimist, can you build <laughs> pathological diffeomorphisms of compact manifolds? Is there a way of systematically building pathological diffeomorphisms? So I'm going to give away the theorem first. <laughs> um, so here's the, here's the theorem, which is joint uh, with Benji, the main theorem. Let's take M to be either the closed unit disk in R2 or the two-dimensional torus. So these are taken as examples of something that are very concrete. These are the simplest possible cases. Then the set of pairs ST, such that S and T are ergodic C-infinity diffeomorphisms of M, 
And S is equivalent to T by measure preserving transformation, so S is isomorphic to T, is a complete analytic set. So, of course, everyone here knows this means that it's not Borel in a very, very dramatic way. There are more sophisticated questions that can be asked, which is where this equivalence relation is placed inside the hierarchy of uh, analytic equivalence relations. And we know a little bit about that too, namely the isomorphism problem for countable graphs is reducible to equivalence with respect to measure preserving transformations on the diffeomorphisms. For abstract measure preserving transformations, so without the structure of diffeomorphisms, in fact, we know it's turbulent. So I, I do want to remark that in the case of diffeomorphisms of the torus, uh, the, the question of turbulence is completely open, namely it's not known whether you can reduce a turbulent equivalence relation to it. So this is relevant because you know, these are the S-infinity actions. Now there's another connection which at this point is somewhat wishful thinking, but I hope is more. The classical smooth topological dynamics has to do with the equivalence relation of homeomorphisms conjugacy by homeomorphisms of the diffeomorphisms of the torus. And these are all of the pictures that uh, we've seen on blackboards around the world. In, in this particular case, uh, there's no measure. The conjugacy is by homeomorphisms. And conjugacy by homeomorphism captures attractors, repellers, saddle points, and so on and so forth. It captures all of this uh, fancy phenomenon. Um, so some of the things that I'm sure uh, we've, we've all seen are the Smale horseshoe, the Anosov diffeomorphisms, Axiom A diffeomorphisms. Those all fall under the uh, category now, or they, the, uh, in the category now of structural stability for which there are nice structure theorems. A more exotic phenomenon of the last, I think, 10 or 15 years is the Newhouse phenomena. In the case of ca classical smooth dynamics, all of, the all of the structure theorems give Borel criterion. And my understanding is that it's strongly conjectured by the experts that the union of the structurally, st structurally stable diffeomorphisms with the diffeomorphisms having the Newhaus phenomena is co-meager. So if you ask at least the people I know in the area if this is true, they go, oh yes, of course it's true. We just haven't proved it yet. So it's, it's uh, of that flavor. Now, what's the connection? We work very hard in the category of measure-preserving transformations, but here's a very simple, stupid remark. <laughs> you can just throw away the measure. <laughs> so, uh, if you're looking at diffeomorphisms of the torus that are measure-preserving, they're diffeomorphisms of the torus. So, what's the difference? The issue is the difference between the equivalence relation of measure-preserving transformation and the equivalence relation of conjugacy by homeomorphisms. Now, if you take two measure-preserving transformations where the transformations are uniquely ergodic and they're conjugate by homeomorphism, well, that homeomorphism takes the measure lambda and copies it over to an invariant measure with respect to the other transformation. So you have S and T. Now, since T is uniquely ergodic, that second measure that you've copied over has to be lambda. So we have this funny situation that if you're conjugate by homeomorphisms, you're conjugate by measure-preserving transformations. So another way of saying that is that the equivalence relation of conjugacy by homeomorphism morphisms is a subset, a sub-equivalence relation of the equivalence relation by measure preserving transformations. But look, this was the difficult direction for the reduction by measure preserving transformations. For the measure preserving transformations in this situations where we know it's complete analytic, you're given an arbitrary measure preserving transformation that conjugates that you know nothing about and you have to build a branch through a tree or something. Well, here you're given a homeomorphism, you automatically get a measure-preserving transformation. We already know how to deal with that. So in some sense, all that's required, all that's required is going back through <laughs> a ridiculous construction and carefully checking at each step that you can uh, build the positive conjugacies continuously. And this seems to me to be really quite feasible. 
So the conjecture is that the reduction we do can be improved to show that the equivalence relation of homeomorphisms of, say, C infinity diffeomorphisms of the torus is complete analytic. That would say probably in the current picture there's this co-meager set, in fact, maybe open dense set for which you have a positive structure, and then somewhere in the, <laughs> in the cracks in between that set you have a pathological set for which you have no structure. Okay, what I want to talk about today is the main theorem, uh, which says that, let's say, on the torus or the disk, I'll work on the torus, the set of ergodic diffeomorphisms that are conjugate by measure preserving transformations is complete analytic. Now, unfortunately, the proof of this theorem is really absurdly long and complicated. This is not a short, elegant proof. <laughs> this is, is um, kind of long. And, uh, in contrast to uh, what I had planned to talk, maybe I'll have time at the end to talk more about uh, the symbolic representation, it felt maybe better to give an overview, so I'm going to try to give an overview of the proof. So the proof of this uh, can be split into three non-trivial pieces. I'll talk about why uh, towards the end of the talk, but there's a, a candidate for a collection of diffeomorphisms which are badly behaved, namely the anasov katok diffeomorphisms. So the first step is to come up with a symbolic representation of the anasov katok diffeomorphisms. Having done that, we can, only work, I mean, we can restrict ourselves to the combinatorics of symbolic systems, which is, feels much, you know, you have a lot more freedom with. The second part, and I'll explain what these words mean later, is to build a functor from a class of systems called odometer-based transformations, so these are symbolic systems that are based on odometers, to a class of transformations which we call the circular transformations. And then we have to go back to an earlier reduction we had for the abstract measure-preserving transformations and uh, modify that. Okay, so this is the plan of the talk, to talk about these. In fact, I'm going to talk about two and three and then go back and talk about one. All right, now, I, I want to give an idea of how you build symbolic systems, and there are many ways. Sometimes they're just given to you. But here's a systematic and relatively canonical way. Uh, you have construction sequences, and you take, in some sense, the closure of the construction sequences. So you fix a language sigma, sigma can be finite or countable, it can have two elements if you want. <laughs> um, and you build collections of words, Wn for n a natural number. Each, all of the words in each Wn have the same length. And each word W in Wn occurs at least twice as a subword of some word W prime and Wn plus one. So you're just building collections of words. Okay, this is very, very general. Now, how do you get a symbolic system from this? Well, you let k be the collection of all x in sigma to the z, such that whenever you have an interval i and you take x restricted to i, you can find a bigger interval j, such that x restricted to j is one of the words in wn for some n. Okay. So these are the words that you can parse as being members of Wn. Now for the transformations that we build, the construction sequences we'll be concerned about, uh, the words will be uniquely readable. So this sequence of intervals that go to infinity at both ends, typically, uh, is uh, uniquely determined by the x, by the unique readability. So the, the, this collection, it turns out to be a cl closed invariant subset of sigma to the z. Uh, in fact, k is the smallest closed invariant set with non-empty intersection with each of the basic open sets determined by the WNs. And you can prove things, which I, I won't go into, but there are invariant measures on k, and there are simple criterion for ergodicity and unique ergodicity and so on. There, there are combinatorial criterion for this that are our details at the moment. An important class, which is not built this way, but uh, will be relevant for us, is the class of odometer transformations. 
So this is named after the odometer in your car, except we read uh, left to right instead of right to left. Right to left in the car has the, you know, the tenths of the miles and then the miles and so on. And the tenths of the miles accumulate till you get to nine, and then it goes back to zero, and you add one to the ones, and then that goes up to nine, you add one to the tens and so on. Here, the odometer is Z mod K1Z cross Z mod K2Z cross Z mod K3Z and so on. And this has an invariant measure under the transformation that you add 1 to the first k, to k1, and you keep adding 1 till you get up to k1, then you go back to 0, and you add 1 to the next column, and you keep adding 1, and so on. Very familiar uh, is the dyadic odometer, where all the kn's are 2, but here we're going to have the odometer with arbitrary kn's. Why is this relevant to us? Well, uh, we're going to be looking at odometer-based systems. So a uniquely readable construction sequence, Wn, N, and N, is odometer-based if for every N there's some Kn such that Wn plus 1 is a subset of Wn to the Kn plus 1. I'm sorry? Okay. <laughs> Whichever one's right. I think <laughs> KN, okay? So the, what this is saying is that you get the words in WN plus 1 by taking concatenations of words from WN. Okay? Uh, this is as opposed to other kinds of constructions where you take the words from WN and you stick in fillers. So these are, if you want, this is a kind of cut and stack, which is another way of, of doing this representation. Now, uh, what's the point of this? Well, if you take elements of K, which is this kind of completion of the WNs, you get a sequence of, of natural numbers as follows. You look at the zero element, for, you know, these are Z sequence, so you look at the zero element, and you ask, where is zero in the word W1? Okay, it's some number between 0 and k1 minus 1. Where is that, the one word inside the two word, and that's some number less than k2, where is that inside the three word, and so on. So I have a picture of that. So you look at the location of 0, and you ask where does it fall. Now, what happens when you shift? When you shift the position of 0 in the W1 word goes up by 1. Unless you're at K1 minus 1, in which case it drops to 0, and if it drops to 0, the position in K2 goes up by 1. Unless you're in the last position there, in which case it drops to 0 and so on. So it's like your odometer rolling over. In other words, the odometer, this product of Z mod K and Zs, is a factor of the Kronecker factor uh, of any odometer-based system. So if you take an odometer-based system, you can read off an element of the odometer from this odometer-based system, and this preserves the dynamics. Okay, now there's an idea here which I don't want to go into, and that is randomized construction sequences. And randomized construction sequences say that when you have choices of how to build the words, you either, you build the words randomly subject to whatever rules of the game are there. So sometimes you have rules of the game corresponding to positive information about conjugacies you're trying to build, but those are the only rules, and otherwise you do things randomly in the sense of law of large numbers type of, of, of randomness. So here, the odometer, the product of Z mod KNZ is a factor of the Kronecker factor of every odometer system, and with just a minimum amount of randomness in the word construction, it turns out that this is the Kronecker factor. Okay, well, these are easy to deal with. You want to build some information in, I have WN, and I want to build WN plus 1, I just use the ordering of the way I put the words in to put in information in the construction to make something complete analytic. And 
roughly speaking, that uh, worked in the past. But there's a relatively famous problem, which is, are there any measure-preserving diffeomorphisms of the torus or of the unit square that have any non-trivial odometer factors? This is completely open, whether the dyadic odometer can be realized or even as a factor of any diffeomorphism. So the, the kinds of constructions that worked in the past just simply don't work here, and, and uh, this was something that we, we had to overcome. Okay, so odometers are apparently useless for working with diffeomorphisms, but they're combinatorially uh, fairly tractable. So now I want to tell you uh, what a circular system is. Now, I'm going to put a bunch of formulas on the board. You probably aren't going to remember them. <laughs> but I, I do want to say they look sort of arbitrary from our point of view, but they're not. Uh, for example, Michelle Herman showed that uh, if you take a diffeomorphism of the disk, a measure-preserving diffeomorphism of the disk, then the rotation number on the boundary, if the rotation number on the boundary is diaphantine, then arbitrarily close to the boundary there are invariant curves. And this precludes ergodicity, because if you have an invariant curve, the inside and outside are invariant sets. <laughs> so this precludes ergodicity, which means that the rotation numbers have to be Liouvillean. And some work of Yakuz and some other people have uh, given some number theoretic restraints on what kinds of rotations uh, you can build and what the rotation numbers can be and so on. And I'm giving you kind of the simplest possible sequence of rationals <laughs> that obey those rules uh, from the information that they have. So the first is easy. Let's take two sequences, Kn and Ln, of natural numbers, which tend to infinity monotonically. And let's let P0 equal Q0 equal 1. And now Pn plus 1 will define to be Kn, Ln, Qn plus 1. And Qn plus 1 is Kn, Ln, Qn squared. Okay, I didn't promise this was going to be pretty, okay? So these are numbers. Now, um, here are some facts. It's quite easy to check that Pn and Qn are relatively prime. And therefore, Pn is invertible, mod Qn. So we're going to let Ji be the number Pn inverse I, mod Qn. So that's, to make that concrete, that's a number between 0 and Qn minus 1, which is the ith. Uh, you, you sum the Pn, Pn inverse until you get to I. Now, if we let alpha n be Pn over Qn, clearly alpha n is rational, and alpha n plus 1 is alpha n plus 1 over Qn plus 1. And if the Qn plus 1s go to 0 pretty fast, which, uh, well, so the alpha n's tend to sum alpha if the Qn's, 1 over Qn's go to 0. And if the QNs go to zero pretty, f go to infinity fast, so the one over QNs go to zero fast, then the sequence alpha N is a witness that alpha is Liouvillean. In other words, alpha is approximable by rationals very quickly. Now, the sum of one over LN being finite means the LNs have to grow fast, and uh, QN plus one is KN LN. Qn squared, so if the Ln's grow fast, the Qn's grow fast. So, okay. Um, I'm, I'm not going to stress this part, but this, <laughs> this ends up being important. Um, okay, now, we're going to talk about, remember our goal is to build a collection of symbolic systems. And these symbolic systems are supposed to be rich enough that we, whenever we play with these symbolic systems, they correspond by magic to diffeomorphisms. So we can do all of our combinatorics on these symbolic systems. Now, uh, these symbolic systems are, the idea is you take an odometer. So what do odometers look like? Odometers at a finite approximation of an odometer. An odometer looks like this. And we take the circle, and we wrap the odometer around the circle. 
So at the nth stage, we take the odometer and we wrap it around the circle, and then we just give it the tiniest nudge by 1 over qn plus 1, or the difference between qn plus 1 you know, by 1 over qn plus 1, we give it the slightest nudge. So what we do is we just give it a tiny little nudge here by qn plus 1, and we're going to take a limit of those. Now, what happens is that when you wrap the nth odometer around the circle, it wraps perfectly, but when you give it the 1 over qn plus 1 slight nudge, what you get is, if, if you start here, you get a little bit of stuff hanging over the end, which, sorry, you get a little bit of stuff at the beginning and a little bit of stuff at the end. Symbolically, that's going to correspond to this operation. So you take words W1 up to WK, so these are just arbitrary words in a language sigma, together with two symbols B and E, which stand for beginning and end. And you define a symbolic operation by taking C and applying it to W1 up to WN, and C of W1 up to WN, so W1 up to WK, product here means concatenation. So it's the concatenation from 0 to Q of the concatenation from 1 to K of B to the Q minus JI, W to the L minus 1, E to the JI. This is some operation, okay? <laughs> this should be WI, thank you. So that's absolutely correct. So it's B to the Q minus JI, W, sorry, no, B to the Q minus JI, WJ to the L minus 1, E to the JI. Thank you. Ah, there should be a J, it should be 1 less than or equal to J, less than or equal to K. Yeah, so it should be 0 less than or equal to I, okay. Yeah, thank you, okay. So much for having clean slides. Okay, so that's the, the formula, I hope. Now, uh, of course, I'm leaving off subscripts. <laughs> this should be C sub n, and should be K sub n, L sub n, and Q sub n. We're gonna, okay, there's enough complication in this formula without putting all the subscripts. Uh, notice that Q minus Ji plus Ji is Q, and that's the length of the words W. So each of the inner, product, inner factors here have length uh, Q times L, and there are K of them, so the length, ignoring the first product, is K, Q, L, and you have Q of those, so you get K, L, Q squared, which magically was the formula for Q, N plus one, okay? So all of this is not a coincidence, okay? This is what, what's supposed to happen here. All right, so what is a circular system? A symbolic system K is circular if it's built from a construction sequence Wn for n a natural number where W0 is sigma, so this is your base alphabet, and Wn plus 1 is built from the words sitting in Wn. So Wn plus 1 is a collection of words built by applying the operator C to words W1 up to Wk, which belong to Wn. So this is a, a circular system. Now notice we can take an arbitrary collection of words, W1 up to Wk from Wn, and apply C to it. So this gives us a way of building circular construction sequences from odometer-based construction sequences. So let's suppose that we're given an odometer-based construction sequence, Wn, N, and N, and from that, let's construct a circular sequence, Wnc, for N and N, and maps Cn from Wn to Wnc. So we're going to build that by induction. Well, there's nothing to do with the first step. <laughs> W0 is equal to sigma, and W0c is equal to sigma. Now, suppose that we're given Wnc and C sub n. 
Then we let WN plus 1 be the operation script C applied to the images of W1 up to WN where the concatenation W1 up to WKN is in WN plus 1. In other words, the concatenations that live in WN plus 1 give us a recipe for applying the circular operator to the images of those words in WNC. And the map CN plus 1 is obvious now. CN plus 1 of W1 up to WKN is just the operation C, script C sub n applied to CN of W1 up to WK. Okay. Now, if K is an odometer-based sequence with construction sequence, is an odometer-based system with construction sequence, WN, for n a natural number, we set f of k to be kc, which is the circular system with the construction sequence wnc. So you start off with, this turns out to be more canonical than it appears, but you start off with uh, an odometer construction sequence. You transform the odometer construction sequence using this circular operator, and you get another circular construction sequence, and the map takes you from the odometer system to the circular system. That's the functor. F. So here's a theorem. The map F defines a functor from the category of odometer based systems where the morphisms are joinings to circular systems where the morphisms are joinings. In other words, the odometer systems with sequences KN, now this is not assuming anything about the LNs, the odometers are just based on the KNs. Um, the odometer-based systems, there, maybe I should say what adjoining is. <laughs> okay. So if we have a system XT and YS, we can look at X cross Y and T cross S. And we look at adjoining, oh, sorry, I should say, give the measures here, x, t, mu, and y, s, nu. So we have a measure mu here and a measure nu here. Adjoining is a measure on the product space whose marginals are mu and nu and are invariant under t cross s. Now, there's always one of them, namely the product measure of mu cross nu. But often there are many more, and the joining structure is, is a much finer structure than the structure of isomorphism. But if we have an isomorphism between x and y, or a factor from x to y, that gives us a map. Let me draw it as a diagonal map. This is an isomorphism from x to y that takes the measure mu to nu. So an isomorphism is a measure on the graph of that isomorphism. So an isomorphism is an example of a joining, as are factors. So joinings capture a much richer structure than the, the usual structure of factor maps and uh, isomorphisms. In particular, since this is very general about joinings, it gives a reduction of odometer-based systems under the equivalence relation of isomorphism to circular systems under the equivalence relation of isomorphisms. Okay, now I need to say just a little bit more to be honest here. Um, this, I think, for this audience is, is a redundant slide, but let me, this is an obligatory redundant slide. We're going to reduce the ill-founded trees to non-isomorphic pairs of diffeomorphisms. So let's let T be the space of trees. To show that a set A contained in X cross X is complete analytic, in other words, is not a Borel set, we build a continuous function R for reduction from T to X such that for all trees T and T, T has an infinite path if and only if R of T is in A. So we want to build a reduction from the space of trees to the space of pairs ST such that S is isomorphic to T. 
Now this strategy worked before. There's an older theorem uh, with uh, Dan Rudolph and Benji Weiss, which says that the set of pairs S and T, such that S and T are, are ergodic and isomorphic, as measure-preserving transformations is a complete analytic set. Now this is, I mean, depending on your taste, <laughs> that's the end of the story, but uh, the point is that's for abstract measure-preserving transformations and we're trying to prove the same result for diffeomorphisms, which are, is the concrete case. Now the result is proved by the reduction taking values in an odometer system. So this takes values in, in the odometers. But, so a priori it's not relevant to diffeomorphism. Well, we want to make the range a collection of smooth measure preserving transformations. So what we wanted to do is to compose the uh, reduction from this paper with, with Rudolf and Weiss to the functor from the odometer based systems to the circular systems and then if we succeed in proving that the circular systems are exactly the symbolic representations of the anasov katok diffeomorphisms, we'd be done because we have a reduction to circular systems and circular systems are canonically isomorphic to diffeomorphisms victory. Okay. Uh, life isn't so simple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I, I'll give a flavor of this. In fact, it's much worse than, than the flavor that I'm going to give. Uh, given a sequence Kn and Ln, we found a, a canonical collection of irrationals, which actually have interesting number theoretic properties, but uh, that's a, a side issue. So this collection of irrationals we call the central values. So this is a subset of the unit interval, but we're going to take the unit interval and wrap it around the circle. So we're identifying the unit interval with the circle. Now, the anasov katok diffeomorphisms are indexed by the sequences Kn and Ln. So for each anasov katok diffeomorphism T, and each central value beta, it turns out that there's an element S in the centralizer of T, such that the Kronecker factor of S contains the rotation E to the minus 2 pi I beta T. Okay, so uh, what's going on is, uh, okay, elements of the centralizer have to have these uh, rotations as factors, and at least these central values occur as the factors, as the Kronecker factors of uh, elements of the centralizer. By the way, every centralizer is a set of S that commute with T. So, this, okay. so why do we care? Well, this implies that the centralizer of each anasov katok diffeomorphism is an uncountable perfect set contains an uncountable perfect set, whereas the measure-preserving transformations that we built in the previous paper had countable discrete sets as their centralizers. The centralizers were just the powers of T. So we're stuck here. There's something really different going on because of the, of the topology, because you're working with smooth transformations. So, okay, so we have to deal with this. Uh, the reduction we build has stronger combinatorial properties. Essentially, it's a construction that builds information about conjugacy uh, between partially constructed transformations if we extend the tree, and otherwise we make the approximations to S and T mutually random, and then we have to do some more work to anticipate what the uh, elements of the centralizer are. I'm not saying why the centralizer is relevant. There's, there's a whole lot I'm not saying here, but the centralizer turns out to be a key part of the construction. All right, let's go back here to diffeomorphisms. We, we now, so far we've stayed in a purely discrete situation. Set theorists like these discrete things. Uh, we're working with symbols, finite constructions, combinatorics on words and permutations and so on. So our, from our point of view, the question when we want to go to diffeomorphisms is, is there a uniform construction of a class of diffeomorphisms that allows you infinitely many opportunities to inject arbitrary, finite, random information into the construction? 
I mean, often diffeomorphisms are built by approximations. You're building a solution to a differential equation. But here you want to do it so that you can just do anything you want at infinitely many stages. So you can build things to try to encourage isomorphisms or to kill isomorphisms or, and so on. Now, uh, J.P. Tuvino suggested to us in a conversation that we look at the anasov katok diffeomorphisms. Now, the anasov katok diffeomorphisms are, are famous in ergodic theory because it was the first example, one canonical example of uh, an ergodic transformation is to take the unit circle, so this is the boundary here, and rotate by an irrational. So this is discrete spectrum. The eigenvalues of this are the powers of alpha. Can this be realized on a two-dimensional manifold? So is there a smooth transformation that's isomorphic to an irrational rotation? Now, it's really, really hard <laughs> to imagine such a thing. So now you want to take, for example, the solid disk and put this irrational on the solid disk. Well. The first thing you try is this, but that's clearly not ergodic because you have an inside and an outside again. So you somehow have to smear this irrational rotation around sufficiently. By the way, this is the closed unit disk, so uh, there's no cheating at the bottom. You can't just push all the problems off to, to infinity at the boundary. Um, so the anasov katok construction was the first to build something like this, and I'll give a, a short outline of it at the end. Um, but it, it was viewed as a way of constructing uh, weird objects. So let me give a, a brief description of how these are made. Uh, first of all, we're going to use this sequence of rationals. Everybody remember the formula? <laughs> so uh, we have a sequence of rationals alpha n. Now, I'm going to work on the torus. So I'm going to view the torus as the unit interval across the unit interval, but the x-axis is going to be more important to us, so we're going to elongate on the x-axis, so here's 0, and here's 1, and alpha n is pn over qn. And we can partition the x-axis into these intervals of size 1 over qn. Now, there are issues half open, half closed, and smoothness, and so on. Okay, I just ignore those. Okay, those are troublesome, but okay. Um, now, what happens here if we take, let's call this the fundamental domain. If we take this and translate by alpha n, we get another uh, square here, another rectangle here, which I call 2. And then you go to 3, and then you go to 4, and so on. And as you move through this system, what you get, you, you get all of the squares because pn and qn are relatively prime. So you fill up the, so the ith square here is ji. So we can either look at the geometric ordering, which is what we have here, or we can write this in what we call the dynamical ordering, which is you take those squares and you pull them out and you write them down in the order that you visit them. So the construction is going to go by building uh, diffeomorphisms on each of those squares and approximating them by these cyclic transformations. Notice the rotation by alpha n, which I call R sub alpha n. This is a periodic process, okay? It, go, it returns to itself. And if we take this piece and divide it up and send it to square number two, say by sending this here and this here and this here, we'll end up again with the periodic process. So these are periodic processes of order qn. Now what happens to these processes when you go from alpha n to alpha n plus 1? This is what I was describing here. Let's uh, try to parse this picture. We, we look at an interval i, which is of width 1 over qn, and i gets sent to its rotation. Do I have a pointer? Uh, yes, okay. It gets sent to its rotation, which is this interval, r alpha of i. Now, when you go to 1 over qn plus 1, the interval i gets divided into pieces of size 1 over qn plus 1, which is much smaller than 1 over qn. And when you rotate by alpha n plus 1, it takes the interval i and shifts it by 1 over kl q squared and takes an interval j, for example, this last interval j, and moves it here. 
So what's happening, the, this translation of J to its overlap here is what's going on at the B's and the E's, the beginning and the ends of this symbolic representation. Okay. Now, the Anosov katok transformations are built by a series of approximations Tn. Each Tn is of the form Zn composed with R alpha n composed with Zn inverse. Again, this is a detail that is, is important. There's a trick here. Each Zn will be of a special form, H1, H2, composed to Hn, where each Hi is a diffeomorphism of the square. Now, the point here is each Ai can have arbitrary C infinity norm. So you can do any kind of damage you want with Hi subject to a condition. So how can you hope that a limit like that is C infinity? It's Zn composed with the rotation, composed with Zn inverse, and the Zn's are incredibly violent. So, you know, how can you hope that converges? Well, there's a trick. You assume that Hn plus 1 commutes with R alpha n. Now, what happens? Let's look at Tn. Tn is defined to be Zn, R alpha n, Zn inverse. Now we can insert Hn plus 1 and Hn plus 1 inverse between the first Zn and R alpha n, because they cancel. And now you move Hn plus 1 inverse to the other side of the R alpha n, because it commutes. And what you get is that Tn is equal to Zn plus 1, R alpha n, Zn plus 1 inverse. Okay, so let's compare Tn plus 1 with Tn. Z, Tn plus 1 is R alpha, Zn plus, Tn plus 1 is Zn plus 1 composed with R alpha n plus 1 composed with Zn plus 1 inverse. And Tn is Zn plus 1 composed with R alpha n Zn plus 1 inverse. So the only term that's different is the term in the middle that one is alpha n plus 1 and one is alpha n. By Continuity of the C infinity norm, or the C, I mean, you do, you do a fusion argument, so it's CK, CK plus one, whatever. By continuity of the CN norms, uh, if you take alpha N plus one sufficiently close to alpha N, TN plus one is sufficiently close to TN in the CN norm. Okay, so as long as you take the rotation sufficiently small, uh, you get convergence, and in fact, any time you have the sum of the one over ln is finite and so on, okay? This is where the, the Leovillian part is coming in. Okay, so com the upshot is that you have complete freedom to choose Hn plus 1 subject to the condition that Hn plus 1 commutes with R alpha n. Well, this is pretty easy. So choose an arbitrary permutation phi of this fundamental domain. So we take an arbitrary permutation here of the first fundamental domain. So we first divide it into a checkerboard. And we send this thing here, and this one goes here, this one goes here. Now this has to commute with alpha n, so we just take this permutation. It has to be equivariant, so we just run it over here. And we take the isomorphic permutation, so we take the same permutation here. This piece goes here or wherever. Okay, so you just copy it by the alpha n's and you get something that commutes with R alpha n. So here's a, a picture of it. You choose an arbitrary permutation phi of the first portion of the domain and you extend this permutation to an equivariant hn plus 1 by just copying it over on all the rectangles and you visit all of the rectangles. Again, there's a lot to prove here. You take an arbitrary permutation. This is a discrete object. <laughs> you have to show that you have a smooth approximation up to something that the difference between the permutation and the smooth approximation measure theoretically converges and apply Borel Cantelli and so on. So there's a smoothing lemma here too, which is, as far as I know, new. Um, so we had to prove something uh, about smoothing this. Okay, so the theorem is here for this part is that if you have an anosov katok diffeomorphism, an arbitrary one, any of them built using the, the anosov katok technique, if there are any experts in the audience, the untwisted anosov katok technique. There's a twisted version, but we didn't get there or need it. 
So if you have an Anasov catalog diffeomorphism, then T has a symbolic representation as a circular system. And at least as important to us, if you take any circular system, it can be realized as an Anasov catalog diffeomorphism. Okay, now we can forget about the geometry <laughs> and we just work with these circular systems and permutations of the words. Okay, so let me uh, summarize the talk and I'll, I'll end in a, a couple of seconds. So, uh, summarizing, uh, we improved the reduction of the ill-founded trees to the odometer systems that we had before because of this additional difficulty that we ran into. Then we apply the functor from the odometer system to the circular systems. And then we appeal to the fact that circular systems are isomorphic to diffeomorphisms, so we only have to work on the uh, diffeomorphisms. That looks like the same slide. That looks like... Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, any questions? Yes. Uh, I understand that you show that um, equivalence of uh, diffeomorphism of uh, consciousness for uh, these two, two cases, the, the disk and the, the torus. Yeah, it's a complete, complete analytic, complete analytic set. That's right. And uh, now I'm asking something naive, which I know very, very little about it. Is there a, a manifold, a natural manifold, where it's not a complete analytic set, or is it? Is the thing means that for every reasonable manifold? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I do know there are manifolds where the collection of diffeomorphisms is is, is fairly small. Um, what we need here are circle actions. So you need to be able to approximate. Basically, you need this kind of picture, so you need a, a free circle action on the on a set of measure one for the manifolds. Mm -hmm. But I, there are these weird non-orientable uh, manifolds. Oh, very few diffeomorphisms. Relatively few diffeomorphisms, yeah. Mm -hmm. Relatively few ergodic diffeomorphisms, yeah. Any more questions? So you mentioned the role of unique ergodicity in this kind of plan for um, resolving the, the version with homeomorphisms. So when you build these Anasov catalog things, they're ergodic, but can you make them uniquely Yes, ergodic? they are uniquely ergodic. They're automatically uniquely ergodic? Yes. Okay, thanks. The, the realizations we build of these circular systems are uniquely ergodic. So, no more questions? Okay, so let's thank Matt again. Thank you very much.